Welcome back to another episode of the Cody Tucker Show. As always, I'm your host, Cody Tucker. Be sure to like and subscribe, all that good stuff. So, I uh, I have found a new hobby in life. Um, it's not a cardio, obviously, but <laughs> so uh, I have been diving deep into the world of uh, the uh, kind of AI you know, weird shit that's going on, um, specifically with this chat GPT, which I mean, has kind of just blown up over the past couple weeks. Um, but people are using it to write like their fucking term papers in college, like all kinds of stuff. I have been using it pretty much all day today to write like to basically create fake songs like fake song lyrics from famous artists just to see like how good is this AI stuff and boy it is wild so I'll read off one that I did um, so this one I did earlier this morning and it is so basically I just entered like write a fake so and so songs. I did like Bob Dylan, Marilyn Manson, uh Rolling Stones, like basically just picked all like my favorite artists and people who I thought it would be funny to see like how would a computer create like their song. And in honor of me just like being a massive fan of this individual. And systematically shitting on him quite a bit even though mass fan of music so i decided to do it with uh the boss himself bruce springsteen uh, i did that like this just a little while ago and boy is it <laughs> i mean it is crazy how like how this sounds exactly like it sounds like somebody making fun of bruce springsteen which really if you listen to any springsteen song and read the lyrics Every one of his songs kind of sounds like it already sounds like AI making Bruce Springsteen songs. Like every single song, because like in your head, if you think of like what are the um, what is like the gist of every Springsteen song? There's always a car. Um, be it's basically every song is about being young, living in a blue collar town. Having a girlfriend who is sort of hot, but not really. Having a hot rod and wanting to leave said town, said girlfriend, said life. Uh, and go out to, like, bigger and better things. That is... Oh, and then there's always, like, a bar. <laughs> and every song ends in either town or land. Um, that is the gist of every Bruce Springsteen song. That being said, I am a still, I should probably let it be known, I am a massive fan of The Boss. So the, the lyrics that came up whenever I did it just a little while ago was, I was born in a small town on the streets where dreams go to die, but I had a fire in my heart that burned bright as the stars in the sky. That, I had to look it up because I was like, okay, I mean, that's for sure a Springsteen song. Like, it isn't. Not that I could find. This is 100% just AI making a Bruce Springsteen song. And then, like, the chorus is, which, I mean, I'll try to I'll try to give the boss a little, you know, courtesy. Uh, I'm a blue-collar man with a heart of gold. <laughs> I'm just trying to make a living in a world that's growing cold. I mean, that is, 
my God. And then you just have, you know, a seven foot tall uh, black dude busting out a sax solo over that. Like, give it to him, Clarence. One, two, three. Uh. Yeah, that is. And then last of uh, I've seen my share of hard times and I've been knocked down to my knees. But I always rise back up with the strength that comes from belief. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, like if I was a washed up musician, Marilyn Manson, um, which I did it with Marilyn Manson and it was fucking equally as incredible. Um, But if I was somebody like that and just maybe having like writer's block, I would 100% use AI to just write my songs for me from now on. It is, boy, is that fascinating. And I mean, I've just been doing it with all kinds of stuff. I've had it like write like movie synopsises, synopses, um, like just giving it, you know, random suggestions of like a horror movie script. And then it actually writing like a pretty extensive script with dialogue. Now the dialogue, <laughs> Uh, is very um like Tommy Wiseau like it <laughs> it's a uh, hello Mark like it does not make a whole lot of sense but the like synops synopses that it's coming up with is staggeringly good I mean this thing is gonna be trouble um I mean as we know from old you know old Blake I mean this AI world is it's coming in hot, and I don't think any of us are really ready for it, especially the boss. Um, so I just thought I would, you know, kick off things talking about that. But um, what else has been going on? So, um, you know, I try to obviously talk a little bit about the news and the world that's going on, uh, what's going on in the world around us. Uh, I haven't really been paying attention to anything other than the fact that that the Dalai Lama is <laughs> the Dalai Lama is <laughs> is the wildest motherfucker on this planet. This dude. So if you haven't seen the video, the Dalai Lama is meeting this little boy who apparently it was like his wish to meet the Dalai Lama, which already slightly odd. Uh, and then the Dalai Lama keeps like you know touching his forehead to his forehead kind of like flirting with the kid, (laughs) like doing little, you know, well, Inuit kisses, um, a few butterfly kisses as well. And then sticks his tongue out at him and asks and not ask, tells the kid to to suck his tongue. (laughs) It is awesome to know that me and the Dalai Lama have like the same pickup lines. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> That's always my go-to is um a a kid suck my tongue. My god, obviously I do not do that to children, but adults love it when you call them kids, so <laughs> yeah, wild. I mean 2023 has been is, you know, it's a hell of a year for the, you know, his holiness himself to be getting canceled. My God, none of us stand a chance. I only look, and now I know with this little well, someone talking about with this AI shit that like, um, I mean my privacy is gone. Speaking of, I did make a TikTok for the old uh, shit show here, so you know, if you are inclined, uh, please subscribe to the old TikTok. Um, I mean I'm losing every ounce of my privacy so i should at least you know maybe get something out of it um i mean i am dreading the day that all of my like search history becomes public and everything i've said to people like in high school and junior high like (laughs) kind of like first learning the world of texting and like (laughs) chat (laughs) oh god i'm gonna be fucked um I mean, I don't think I ever did anything, like, too crazy. But, I mean, if the Dalai Lama can get canned, boy, I am. I mean, they're they're probably already, you know, setting up a cell at fucking Sing Sing for me. 
Uh oh. So um, yeah, I mean, the do- telling a little kid on camera in front of a giant group of people to suck his tongue, and the kid kind of like looks around like, "Hey, like, is this motherfucker serious?" Which, according to the Dalai Lama himself, which there's no way this motherfucker tweets himself, but the Dalai Lama's people, uh, hey, guys, just you know, he likes to goof. He's, you know, he's a bit of a goofball. And, (laughs) I mean, this is, like, exactly what was in the tweet, basically, was that, like, hey, the Dalai Lama's got a a sense of humor that maybe some people don't get. (laughs) I watched the video a lot. Just trying to find the point to where, like, where in this interaction with this kid did the Dalai Lama think, I bet this little fucker would suck my tongue if I told him to. Like, trying to find that little, like, you know, glimmer in his eye when he realized, like, I'm going to get my tongue sucked by this kid. I couldn't really pinpoint it, but, I mean, God, it's just so fucking creepy. And, I mean, I will say, every Catholic on this planet is so happy right now. (laughs) Normally, when you hear of a religious leader, um asking a kid to suck their tongue. There happens to be a particular <laughs> religion that um, everyone's eyes go to. Like, oh, what a shock. Fucking Father uh, Callahan uh, got a, <laughs> a little buzzed and got a little frisky with one of the altar boys. But no, this time, it's the goddamn His Holiness himself. You know, the whatever 15th re- reincarnation of... Um, Buddha or some shit. Um, Wild. Very interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, my first reaction was, well, let's see what the kid was wearing. Because, you know. (laughs) You never know. Um, And then I thought, man, I bet the... I mean, the Dalai Lama is like, what, 80-something? 88? He's probably... Actually, he might be close to 90. I mean, that dude has been living, like, in exile. I mean, what's that movie, like... There's some movie I think Martin Scorsese made about, like, the Dalai Lama as a kid. I don't know. Uh, I'm, I could be shazamming this right now. Or kazamming this right now. Um, I... I mean, he's an old man. He's He looks real... Summer squashy. Like, very sun-dried... I bet his tongue is rough as a motherfucker. That dude's probably got like a cat's tongue. Ugh. Can you imagine sucking that thing? It'd probably like shred your lips. <laughs> I mean, as soon as you pull your lips back, it's like, you know, like, I mean, this might just be, this might not be a thing most people know. But like if you pet a stingray or a sh- or maybe a shark, like a little, the little sharks, like if you go to an aquarium where they have like where you can kind of just like corner a fucking shark and, you know, pet it. You have to pet like with the grain or whatever. If you go up the shark's body, it'll just shred your fucking hand. That's what I imagine the Dalai Lama's tongue is like. Like pushing back, the tongue's probably, you know, like a little leathery, but like soft leather. Like, um, you know, like a belt. It'd be like licking licking up a belt. But then the pullback, like pulling your lips back, I mean, I bet your the inside of your lips are just torn to fucking pieces. <laughs> God, you couldn't fucking pay me to suck the Dalai Lama's tongue. Well, uh, no, you know. So I don't know how old this kid was. He looks like he's probably, I would guess, nine, maybe, nine, ten, eight, maybe eight. Um... Maybe seven. <laughs> I just got through every number. Um, when I was, let's say, eight, there are a lot of celebrities who could have gotten me to suck their tongue. The Dalai Lama wouldn't have been one of them. I'm like, who the fuck is this dude? Um, but, you know, there, there's, there's quite a few. Um, like Alex Trebek. Alex Trebek could have 100% got me to suck his tongue. Um, I mean, I watch Jeopardy every day, and literally 
Not like figured, literally cried whenever Alex Trebek uh, passed. So, yeah, Alex Trebek, Dale Earnhardt. <laughs> I mean, the Intimidator could 100% got me to suck his tongue. You know, the Dalai Lama, though, that's an interesting one. I mean, I guess if you're going to, you know, if you're going to fuck a religious leader, he probably would be the best one to do. I mean, Pope, Pope Francis isn't too bad. I mean, I'd probably give give Pope Francis a go. I definitely wouldn't have done any of the popes before him. I mean, Benedict, good lord. God, his ass cheeks probably look like fucking... His ass cheeks probably look like a rotten pumpkin. <laughs> so, anyways. So that's what happened with the, uh, with the Dalai Lama. So if you see uh, his holiness trending, <laughs> uh, that's why. Um, so, an- God damn, another thing that happened... So yesterday, I um, yesterday I ordered some food, obviously, uh, pretty fair amount of food from a restaurant. Uh, I won't say the name of the restaurant, but it rhymes with um, Rex's Toad House, <laughs> and f- the fucking audacity of. And this isn't just them. I mean, I've been to coffee places that do this too. Um, like, especially like any kind of like local, like, uh, like sometimes I'll go to, you know, like some kind of like local coffee shops or whatever, which they're the fucking worst about it, really. I mean, restaurants, it kind of makes more sense. Um, but the whole fucking new, uh, I guess, tradition or push towards making you tip for to-go orders is driving me fucking bananas. The I was under the impression and have been my entire life that a tip goes to a waiter for the waiter giving you service. So, better the service, better the tip. I usually tip 20-25% Unless that amount is less than, like, if 20% would end up being less than $5, I just give a five. Like, I'm not going to tip less than $5. Um, otherwise, more than that. Or um, double tax. That's usually like a good rule of thumb. Um, is I'll do like, you know, double the tax, maybe a little extra. Um, unless the waiter's like super good, give like an extra good tip, because that's the fucking point. I mean, waiting, being a waiter slash waitress, is a service job. The better your service, the better money you make. Uh, The flip side, the shitter you are at your job, the less you get paid. That's the fucking trade-off. Do I think that that's necessarily right? No, I mean, in a really, I believe that restaurants should just pay their fucking workers a decent wage uh and then we don't tip at all like you just do your job as a waiter and don't worry about like being good or bad and getting extra or less just do the fucking job and the restaurant should be paying you more than fucking two dollars an hour plus tips which most restaurants do this bullshit where they pull tips and like You have to share your shit with the fucking bus boys who have been out fucking smoking J's the entire time. That's some bullshit. But that's the restaurant biz. Uh, I am not going to tip when I'm just basically going through a drive-thru to pick up shit. Like if I'm calling in food that I am not, I am not going to sit down at your restaurant. I am just needing you to fucking microwave the fucking food. And put it in a goddamn to-go box. Put it in a bag. And then hand it to me out the window. Um, Or at the fucking host table. Whatever. There should not be a request to tip you. Exact same policy. Which, that drives me crazy at a restaurant. For sure. But, I mean, when I brought up coffee shop. That actually is. That's number one for the most just annoying situation for this like i went to so there's this coffee shop in town that i fucking love and i'm not even a huge fan of coffee 
but I like the uh, the ambiance, the location, and the coffee is good. I have to drink decaf coffee because if I drink caffeinated coffee, I feel like my heart's going to fucking explode out of my goddamn throat. That's uh, the life of a, you know, anxiety-riddled fat bastard. But whenever I go to said coffee shop, there aren't waiters. There's a person at a compu- at the table at the desk that you walk up to and say, "I would like this." And I order very simple. I order just a fucking coffee. Um, sometimes like an iced coffee, but I don't like add a bunch of extra bullshit. I don't go, you know, two pumps of fucking two pumps of skim milk, a quarter ounce of leprechaun jizz. Like I don't add it, you know, sprinkle some PCP on the side. Like I don't order anything wild at a coffee shop. Like some people do. I say, uh, I order it like how it is listed on the menu. So if there's an iced coffee that is this thing, that's, I'll just take that. I'll take it as it comes, but the decaf version. So whenever these motherfuckers have the audacity to flip that fucking tablet over <laughs> for you to pick what tip you want to give them, um, I'm putting zero and I'm looking right at your goddamn face when I do it. I'll actually wave my finger over to the highest tip and then go and, and do a zero. Like, you're not getting a goddamn tip from me. And, you know, maybe I'm cheap. I mean, look, I grew up pretty fucking white trash. I try to erase some of the white trashness, but it's still lingering in there. It just is. Um, but I don't even think it's really white trash. I think it's just the principle of the situation is I should not be tipping you. I should not have to pay extra for it. Like you, I mean, and these motherfuckers, so like, they want you to tip them for this fucking coffee, which all you did was just stick your fucking hand under a little, you know, spigot, get the coffee, and then set it. They don't even, like, they don't bring it to you. Like, they don't, they don't do anything that, like, a waiter would do. They literally, like, say, oh, okay, it'll be blah, blah, blah. Uh, it'll be out here in a second. And then they call your name, and you walk up there and get it. So you literally, you should actually get a tip from them for like getting the shit yourself not i mean it is oh it is fucking mind boggling to me how like how really we just let all of these things happen to us <laughs> i mean we really are just sh- fucking sheeple <laughs> I say, stand up, (laughs) go go throw a fucking brick through a, you know, coffee shop window, (laughs) like do the right thing. Um, yeah, I mean, boy, like every time, man, every time they flip that fucking tablet over for you to select your tip, like there is a big part of me that's like, you know, I've never thought about doing a mass shooting, but the thought, I mean, I've I've never given it real thought, but it does cross my mind every time that that tablet comes in. Is like, hmm, like Nashville 2.0. Here we go, Elliot Rampage, Smashville. <laughs> like I'm about to fucking unload in this establishment. But you know, that's society. That's what we live in. You can't just you know. Sometimes you just gotta take the. Uh, Take the reaming and, uh, you know, stay in line. Can't just, can just uh, you know, bring an AR into a place and shoot up people because you don't like the, uh, you know, the tipping system. You know, I wish we lived in that kind of world, but we don't. <laughs> I mean, actually, we kind of do, but anyways, I am, uh, I have exhausted my thoughts on the subject. So time for some did you knows. Um, Fair warning, trigger warning. These three that I'm doing today are not funny at all. Sometimes I try to make them like kind of humorous depending on, you know, the story. Um, I'm just going to preface these three right now. These are dark. (laughs) I mean, they're all somewhat related. They're medical testing somewhat. 
And that's kind of the theme between the three. Um, not a lot of humor to be found in these. Well, a little bit in one of them. You'll know when you see, <laughs> you'll know when you hear it. Um, but yeah, so without further ado, another segment of uh, Did You Know? We'll wrap up the episode and, you know, twenty the 20 people who are listening to this will uh, hopefully enjoy it. So <laughs> here we go. All right, here we go. So first, uh, so again, these three all linked by the fact that they are um, kind of within the medical world. Um kind of just pretty fucked up moments in uh, medical history. Uh, so the first one is, so the first one is the, and I'm probably not going to pronounce this right because it is Swedish, but the Vipholm experiment uh, is either Vipholm or Vipholm. I'll just say Vipholm, probably wrong, um, you know, but also... I don't speak Swedish, so <laughs> fucking sue me. Um, the Vipholm experiment happened in 1947 in Sweden. So in 1947, which this all just goes to show how goddamn dumb people were not that long ago. They, the Swedish uh, medical community at the time, was kind of on the fence about what causes cavities. Which now, we fucking know. It's caused by, well, for me, milk duds. Jesus Christ. Every time I eat a milk dud, it is like my teeth have become cemented together. And I can feel like just this electricity going through the <laughs> going through the back of my teeth. And I'm like, well, I just got six cavities from a single milk dud. But in, apparently in 1947, they didn't know that eating a bunch of sugar and not brushing your goddamn teeth gives you cavities. So, these doctors in Sweden wanted to find out if that is, in fact, how you get cavities. So, what they did is they went to this place called the Vipholm Hospital. The Vipholm Hospital slash Mental Institution... Um, was the, and now I'm just going to read this word for word, what it was called. <laughs> These are not my words. This is what it was called. It was called the Vipom Facility for Uneducable Retards. <laughs> God damn. Woo. History is fucking funny. Um, that is their words, not mine. So what they did is they basically just force fed sugar to 660 patients at the Vipholm facility for uneducable, edu is it educable or educatable? The word, how it was written was uneducable, so I guess that's it. But the Vipholm uneducable facility for retards, <laughs> I won't say it again, I promise. But um, they took 666, uh, 660 patients from said facility and just force-fed them sugar day in, day out. No teeth brushing, no rinsing of the mouth. I mean, you're just sitting there eating fucking Twizzlers, Milk Duds, Raisinets, Junior Mints all day. I will say, sounds like fucking paradise. Um, except, you know, there's no brush. So basically they were trying to see how much sugar and how long it takes before your teeth start rotting out from cavities. So 660 patients had their teeth just completely rotted out. If you have ever had a cavity, then you know how insanely painful it is. Like I am, you know, typically if I, you know, think about putting, you know, a, you know, a bullet in the dome. It's usually because I've been like, you know, I don't know. It's usually while I'm listening to like the cure or, um, maybe even like 
typo negative or something or like watching like requiem for like i'll you know watch like anyway i'll be in a mood where i'm like huh bullet to the dome doesn't sound too bad um but obviously still here so i've never done it probably never will um but i have had a cavity before i've had two cavities in my life and i have never been more close to just sucking on a shotgun <laughs> than I have whenever I had these cavities and had to like wait the you know time before I could get into the dentist's office. Oh my god. It is the it is the most painful thing I've ever experienced in my life. Just this constant fucking throbbing elect like electricity fucking pain just oh fuck. Like it makes my bones like shake thinking about it so i cannot i mean so i know i mean it sounds kind of dumb like oh okay they just had their teeth you know given cavities blah blah blah. there's way worse things that have happened i don't know that there (laughs) i don't know that there is and actually the next um thing i'm going to read about on paper sounds a million times worse but i think i'd rather take the shit i'm about to read about than having my teeth forcibly rotted out not pulled out which obviously would suck too but just that slow oh my god so this is in 1947 in sweden a country where everybody thinks oh the swedish great people do everything wonderfully america should be more like sweden maybe not so that's the vipom experiment this next one is actually i mean most people probably don't know the vipom experiment i think a lot more people have heard of this but still probably don't know the ins and outs and the crazy details. So I again, trigger warning. This one is rough. It is the story of Unit 731. Unit 731 was a basically biological chemical research division of the Japanese government slash military during the Sino-Japanese War. So Sino-Chinese. Chinese Japanese War and World War II. So, started in, I believe, mid 1930s, ended in like the early 1940s. Um, it was led by a guy named Shiro Ishii. Shiro Ishii kind of headed this research, which I think, like, on like the actual documentation was that it was like a water, water treatment research facility, which is hilarious when you find out what was really going on in this place. So what they did during Sino-Japanese War slash World War II is this group who were helping to run the Unit 731 research facility is they would just basically go kidnap mostly Chinese. The, The majority of this testing and the brutal shit that I'm about to go over was done to Chinese prisoners, like prisoners of war, just people that they just go kidnap, women, children, men, soldiers, whatever. Um, but also some Russians, too. There were some Russian um, people who were kind of caught up in, in, uh, in this whole situation. So Unit 731, what they did is they would bring in these you know thousands and thousands of people from we'll just say china because it's mostly china so all these chinese people are getting captured uh and brought in as prisoners to unit 731 like research facilities uh and then just a the most disturbing things ever that i've ever read about were done to these people these poor chinese bastards so one of the things that they were testing was sexually transmitted diseases, like venereal diseases. See what happens to the body when you have them. So they were giving people the old uh, kid rock cocktail of um, <laughs> gonorrhea and syphilis and just seeing what happens. If you've ever looked up what, which I don't really know. I mean, gonorrhea, I think, is just excruciatingly painful. And that's the drip, I believe, or like the clap. Um, but I think you just drip green shit out of your dick, which doesn't sound great, but, um, you know, yeah, that seems a little rough, but syphilis, 
If you've ever looked up what syphilis does to the human body, oh my god. Um, which I'm going to do a little did you know thing about Al Capone. Um, but there is a pretty hilarious story of like what syphilis did to Al Capone. Most syphilis stories, nowhere near as funny. <laughs> I mean, they are brutal. Syphilis just destroys your brain, just fucks you up like completely. So that's one of the things they're doing is injecting people with gonorrhea, which again, excruciatingly painful and syphilis, which just turns you into basically a fucking jackass zombie. Um, pretty horrible gets way, way, way worse. Uh, what they would also do is a practice called vivisection, which vivisection as a word doesn't seem like anything too crazy. What vivisection is, is basically the removal of parts of the body. I don't know if that's the word for word definition, but that's basically what it is. So what they would do Again, I, the idea of research is it's used pretty loosely when talking about Unit 731. There is a an argument to be made that they really, like this, you know, real bag of shit, Shiro Ishii, was really just kind of wanting to fuck people up. Like, it's, it's hard to say how much actual research is being, being done at Unit 731 and how much they just fucking hate Chinese people and want to torture them to death. Um, I mean, obviously, there's some, like, research, like, the sexually transmitted disease thing is fucked up as it is. There is actually some research behind it where, like, you can see where they wrote down, like, and they were operating it as, like, clin as trials. So... Okay, fine. There is some research. This vivisection shit and a lot of the other stuff. I don't know about. Uh, I don't know how much scientific uh, breakthroughs are occurring because of this. But one of the things they would do is they would just cut off a limb, so an arm or a leg, let you bleed out, and basically time it with a stopwatch. See how long it takes you to die from losing an arm or losing a leg. Um, I mean, I guess. <laughs> There is a practical use for that information, but my God, uh, they would also just cut out different organs, see how long it takes for you to die. Meanwhile, all, let it be known, no anesthesia anywhere in sight at Unit 731. Um, <laughs> I mean, they are just raw dogging your ass, cutting your, like, they would, you know, cut a person's stomach out and then connect their esophagus to their intestines um, cut out like kidneys, cut out like all these things and just see like what happens to you. Uh, so the vivisection thing is uh, fucking wild. They're also like cutting out people's eyes and seeing like, if you can die, can you die from that? <laughs> like Jesus, who gives a shit? If you can die from having your eyes cut out, like this is, that's what I'm saying with I don't think they really gave a fuck about learning scientific or achieving scientific breakthroughs. I think they just wanted to fuck, like fuck some people up. Um, and historically, Japanese people have been not all Japanese people. The Japanese military social government historically has been fucking brutal to the Chinese. Just a fact. Um, this is obviously. You don't have to be a historian to be able to draw connections between this and Nazi Germany. Very, very similar. Not saying who's better, who's worse. But, you know, Nazi Germany gets talked a lot about, as they should. Um, not, you know, the greatest group of people. Uh, but the Japanese should 100% get talked about a little bit more. Not that they should be, you know, placed higher than the Nazis. Not saying that. I don't know the numbers. I don't know the impact. What, I mean, I'm, Nazis, Germany, I know the numbers, but, like, I don't know exactly how many people died because of the Japanese. I don't think it's nearly as much, but still, it should get talked about more because um, it's fucking horrendous. So they do this. So they do all these vivisections, give people, you know, the Kid Rock cocktail. Um, they also 
just started doing a bunch of random tests, like putting people in a centrifuge and spinning them to death. I don't know how long it takes to spin to death, but however long it is, it's way too long. It probably takes a good minute. I mean, it's it's probably the worst. That might be one of the worst ways to die, is to spin to death. My God. God. So they would do that. They would also hang people upside down by their feet, leave them for, you know, a couple days. And just see basically how long does it take for you to die from the blood pooling at your brain? Which I believe you start having like cerebral hem- uh, hemorrhages, aneurysm. Like, I mean, it's a b- also another brutal way to go. And then this to me is so the more I've read about what happens to people under very like high like pressurized systems like hyperbaric or not hyperbaric chambers well i guess hyperbaric chamber but like people who get caught up in like these like very like i think let me see if i can find the name of it yeah like low pressure testing where there's like where they just see like what happens to people i mean there's all kinds of examples of this like the dolphin um or dolphin uh, explosion that's one um, that you can read about, or I'll, I'll probably do it on air, but it's pretty fucking brutal too. Um, but one of the testing that they would do was low pressure testing where they'd put people in one of these like low pressure, um, pressurized chambers and just keep tweaking the pressure until their eyes popped out. So the test would see how long does it take not to die necessarily, but to just have your eyes pop out of your head. Like at what PSI or whatever, what pressure uh, unit does that happen? And then the people just get escorted out and, you know, they're alive for a while with their eyes hanging down. Ugh, like that image, that thought is f- so fucking terrifying to me. But that's what they did. So, and then on top of all that, they are also just spraying different chemicals, different pathogens, like the bubonic plague, sp- spreading all these, you know, which the bubonic plague is one they did a lot of, where they're just spreading it on entire towns, entire villages, and then basically, like, putting the people into, like, confined areas and and, and observing them. Like, observing, like, how many people did get infected, how many people don't, how, like, but doing it to just random fucking villages of people who did didn't do a goddamn thing they're just being chinese and hanging out in china doing whatever the fuck it is that chinese people in the 40s did and then suddenly a plane goes over and you think oh well, what the fuck is that eh, who gives a fuck next thing you know fucking granddad has blisters on him you know the size of fucking cds and I mean, the dude looks like he's covered in fucking pepperonis and just pus shooting out and just basically coughs up blood until he dies. And then that happens to your mom, your dad, your uncle, sister, and then you. That's what the fuck Unit 731 did to the number estimated to be between 200,000 and 300,000. It's actually probably whenever you add because a lot of those figures are not including all the people who died from like what i was just talking about with the bubonic plague um you know dropping the bubonic plague on people so incorporating that into unit 731's umbrella it's actually closer to half a million half a million people died from shiro ishii being just a massive piece of shit I mean, it obviously not just him. I mean, it was sanctioned by the Japanese government and a bunch of other people. But, whoo, man. Unit 731 is something that, I mean, that shit will keep you up at night. My God. Um, okay, so. Third and last one. I'm going to talk about another real scumbag. A guy named Walter Freeman. So Walter Freeman, aside from being just a massive hunk of shit, was a neuroscientist, neurologist, whatever, brain doctor. He, you may not know the name Walter Freeman. You may not know 
like when you hear the name Walter Freeman, you may not know why he's such a piece of shit or that he's a piece of shit or even who he is. Walter Freeman is the person who basically invented the transorbital lobotomy. Now, lobotomies had existed before Walter Freeman, uh, which I think Walter Freeman did the first one in, let me see, 1936. So 1936, Walter Freeman does the first transorbital lobotomy. Obviously, like I said, lobotomies had existed before this, but they weren't done the Freeman way. (laughs) The Freeman method was to give people electroshock to kind of anesthetize them, which if you've ever seen what the fuck electroshock therapy does to people, oh my God. I mean, one, you could watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which uh, I still don't know whether that's real or not whenever they do it to old Jackie boy. Um, Where are you? Old Jackie boy. It looks pretty real. Uh, And from what I've seen and read about electroshock therapy, it looks, I mean, that's, that is exactly what the fuck your body does when it happens to you. Actually, there's an interesting story of electroshock therapy involving Lou Reed. Lou Reed, one of my most, like, one of my favorite, most favorite musicians of all time. Former, uh, you know, lead of the uh, Velvet Underground. Massive solo career. Transformers, one of the greatest albums ever made. Lou Reed, incredible human being, incredible artist. Dead, but awesome. Um... Not that those things aren't related. (laughs) So Lou Reed, when he was, I believe, 14, his parents found out that he was bisexual. And this is in, like, you know, the 50s. So uh, that ain't (laughs) not under my roof. (laughs) So Lou Reed gets sent by his parents to a fucking basic, a mental institution where they would do, according to Lou Reed, so much electroshock therapy that he would forget who he was and would just sit at the edge of his bed and drool and stare at the wall all day. And that was his life for a while, living in this mental institution where they would just shock his ass nonstop. Um, from what I've also read about Lou Reed, it didn't work. <laughs> I mean, I think that motherfucker was getting it in any way he could. So, um, but... So back to Walter Freeman, big piece of shit. Um, he would do electroshock therapy to anesthetize someone. And how they perform these lobotomies is... So basically the whole point of it, if you don't know, is that the theory was that bad behavior, um, rebelliousness, schizophrenia, um, depression... Like, all these things are considered, like, mental, cerebral, um, you know, maladies. Could be cured by fucking with the frontal lobe of the brain. And that the best way to get to the frontal lobe of the brain is to jam a fucking ice pick right here by your tear duct into... There's, like, a little bit of a bone by your eye socket. They would chisel that bone. So now you have, like, ice pick right here, tear duct, chisel it in... And they would, you know, bust through that bone and then go stick it into your frontal lobe and just scramble. Just start scrambling it in there and then hope for the best. See what happens. Um, God, it is a fucking crazy thing to think about that this is like sanctioned by the like the a lot of the medical community was behind this this wasn't just like walter freeman being like "Eh, i think i'm just gonna stab some motherfuckers in the eye with an ice pick and see what happens i mean it was like very intriguing to a lot of the medical community there were huge write-ups about its effectiveness which um you know hate to fucking you know spoil things but uh Turns out it wasn't that effective. <laughs> it had like a 15% mortality rate, which for any medical procedure is wild. Um, so just to kind of go through some of these facts about Walter Freeman, I mean, it, it gets nuts. So in 1951, this is when... So he started doing lobotomies in 1936, By 1951, he had done 4,000, roughly 4,000 lobotomies. Out of those 4,000, 100 people died from cerebral hemorrhaging. That's a lot. So, 
in was that 15 years 3651 yeah so in 15 years walter freeman does 4000 lobotomies 100 die from cerebral hemorrhaging odds are not great <laughs> that's not a great uh, not a great stat um in 1951, the reason why, for the most part, why he quit doing transorbital ice pick lobotomies in 1951 is because this motherfucker had gotten so self-absorbed with the fame he was getting, which he was becoming really, really famous from these because, according to him and some other people, like he had partners working with him, he was basically changing the world by doing this. And he was like curing all of these, you know, mental diseases retardations that no one could f fix ever seemingly ever and that he was basically god to himself that's like kind of how he presented himself so much so that he used to do basically exhibitions where he would show how fast he could do a transorbital lobotomy he would also do a thing where he would do two lobotomies at the same time. So he'd have two people sitting on two different beds, ice pick in each hand, stick them in, shake them at the same time while talking to the crowd. Because there would be like a crowd of, you know, medical journalists, doctors, whatever, watching these exhibitions. So he's sticking to in and basically doing this like he's, <laughs> like he's goddamn David Copperfield. Um, and, you know, a lot of these people didn't make it. What a shock. Uh, but in 1951, he was doing a lobotomy on a woman. Had the ice pick in brain. So they are in frontal lobe. And he stops. So he's sticking her. He stops to turn around to like wave to the cameras and take a picture. And accidentally, as he's doing it, doesn't realize that he is slowly jamming the ice pick more and more in. And kills her in front of the entire group of people. Now, these people who had died from cerebral hemorrhaging, usually, I mean, some of them were to, when he was doing these performances, but they were getting carted off and back, you know, off stage before people realized that they had hemorrhaged and died. Um, they just looked like kind of zonked out. And he's like, see, look, he's not, you know, an asshole anymore. <laughs> like, and then they would talk about and everybody's cheering. And then meanwhile, this fucker is bleeding out of his nose and dead. Um, but people hadn't like seen it happen until this one where he's like doing this, leans in and then zing, she's dead, dies in front of everybody. And people are like, oh, fuck, you're a monster. <laughs> so that's like kind of rise and fall during this time. What makes Walter Freeman even more famous is his connection to one of the most infamous slash famous families in U.S. history. The, you know the royal family of America, the Kennedys. Joe Kennedy Sr., father of John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, uh, and old Ted, has a daughter named Rosemary. Rosemary Kennedy had some kind of birth, -ish, had some issues during birth where she may have been like deprived of oxygen. In general, made her a little slow, but not like, not crazy, I mean, not how Joe Kennedy describes his daughter is like he describes her like she was a fucking orc. <laughs> I mean, like that she was just like rummaging through trash and like you know biting people and shit. Like he describes her like she was like a like a gremlin, like a gremlin that got water on it or fed after midnight. That's how he describes Rosemary Kennedy. Turns out she was just slow because her brain had not developed at the pace it should have. Um, so he, wanting to have this perfect family, saw her as a, just a big old spot of shit on that, uh, on that family, uh, tree. So he decided that she should be taken care of and found out about Walter Freeman and found out that like, oh, according to Walter Freeman, I can cure your daughter of all of these, rebe all this rebelliousness and like, you know what Joe Kennedy saw as her being like crazy. I can cure her of all of this. So Joe Kennedy's like, fucking, here she is. Go do it. Well, what they did to Rosemary Kennedy is, 
according to Walter Freeman and his partner who were both there to perform the lobotomy, is that they stuck the ice pick in, started swirling around, and kept going while making her read the Lord's Prayer and also recite the God Bless America song. And they would keep swishing through her frontal lobe until she couldn't remember what like couldn't remember the words to the Lord's prayer and started becoming incoherent. That's when they said, well, she's cured. And Rosemary Kennedy was basically a vegetable for the rest of her life. Lived in a, like a nursing home. Um, basically the family shunned her and, basically, and kind of just pretended like she didn't exist for the rest of time. I think she would get visited by Eunice Schreiber, um, or Eunice Kennedy Schreiber, who ended up making the Special Olympics. Part of that is because of Rosemary Kennedy. Um, so anyway, so yeah. So that's Walter Freeman. Walter Freeman did that. Um, last little fact that is just nuts about these lobotomies is that he did these lobotomies not just to adults. He did a, he did lobotomies to 19 minors, including one... Uh, who was a four-year-old. There is also a interview with a person who I believe was 12 years old when he got a lobotomy from Walter Freeman. And now as far as the, you know, success rate of the lobotomies, there were some successes, including this boy who, not that there was a, a success, it's just nothing really happened to him. Nothing like crazy. He obviously had mental, he had some mental, uh, defects because of it but nothing like debilitating but when he was 12 his dad married this woman who did not want kids and did not like having kids so she when she was alone with the child this 12 year old who she thought was just too rambunctious too wild but really was just a fucking kid and a kid who had just seen his parents get divorced wasn't anything crazy she took that boy without telling the father to Walter Freeman to have him lobotomized. And luckily he didn't fucking Rosemary the kid and he ended up, you know, kind of coming out. Okay. But that just shows like Walter Freeman didn't give a fuck whether these people had any problems, like real problems. Not that there weren't people who had real problems who was, who were getting these lobotomies, but he didn't really care. He just wanted to show the world that he could, fix everyone's problems and if somebody died well that's just you know a thing that has to happen to improve science walter freeman should go down as one of the biggest pieces of shit ever um so like i said not a lot of humor in (laughs) in uh, these three stories but hopefully you found them interesting i think like dark history shit is fascinating so maybe you do too, hopefully. Send in the emails if you want me to talk about anything specific. Um, the email is uh, the Cody Tucker Show at gmail.com. Message me on Instagram, um, whatever. Follow me on TikTok now so you know I'm not losing all my privacy for nothing. Till next week, goodbye.